I need to have the microphone right next to my mouth, or? Uh, it should pick up. Okay, is that good? Uh, say something. Yeah. Uh, hello, 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 hello. You need to talk a little bit louder. All right, hello, hello, better? Uh, try now. How's that, all right? Yeah. Can, can you sit back here? Yeah. All right, okay, all right. Very much so, because I'm sitting up in my chair, which I'm not used to doing. Right. Yeah, I'm going to sit back with my feet up. All right. All right, um, I guess I'll get started. Uh, um, my name is uh, Tim Stanley. I'm from uh, Justia. Uh, we do a lot of uh, free law stuff, and uh, to support our free law stuff, we do a lot of client development stuff. We work a lot of uh, recent grads and uh, actually lawyers that have been out of you know, practicing for a while in terms of how they sort of market themselves. And that's sort of our, our revenue stream. Uh, but a lot of what, it, what that's led to is some thoughts I've had in terms of uh, attorneys getting work, getting jobs, and sort of maintaining their place in the marketplace, especially when things have changed uh, quite a bit. So I'm just going to run through some stuff. A lot of it's going to be on, you know, different things on social media. Uh, and you know, everybody probably has Facebook and Twitter accounts and things like that. You might find some things interesting, some things might not be as interesting. But I'll try to sort of point out the stuff that I've seen uh, in the last, you know, 20 years or so as to why, why things are important, what's not important. Because um, there's a lot of stuff that comes at you, but 90% uh, of it uh, doesn't really matter. It's just there. It's a part of your list, but you don't really need to be doing it. Uh, so here's, here's a quick outline of stuff. I'm going to run through the law school grad market really quick, uh, talk a little bit about uh, uh, past grads as well, um, talk a little bit, just sort of quickly walk through uh, getting a job versus client development, um, and a brief uh, rant about law school and practice management and career services, a little bit about bars too. And then I'll get into the core of the, the talk, which will be basically on social media. And then at the very end, if I have time, I'll, I'll touch on uh, blogging and websites and Google, but, you know, if I have time. Um, just sort of a quick intro. Uh, you know, a lot, you know, there's a lot of stuff you can do on social media, which is good in terms of connecting people up, but it never beats, you know, meeting people in person. So at any time that you want to get a job, if you're a student, or if you want to get work, you know, you get that handshake and you pretty much have a buddy for life. And that's something that I think everybody should realize that social media can do certain things in terms of introducing you to people. Uh, but it will never actually get you the handshake and get you sort of that connection that that that'll give you a sort of a long-lasting uh, uh, ability to, to to work with people. Um, first, let me run through the you know sort of the law school grad market right now. Um, everybody knows that the, the market's really bad. Uh, yeah, I talked to lots. We hire a lot of students, um, and I talked to a lot of students, and they're just having a really rough time uh, getting jobs. It, you know, some people are getting them. There's been, a, you know, some people are getting jobs that are kind of in law, but not, not quite in law. Uh, some folks are just doing other stuff. They, you know, they have the law degree, and, and they sort of continue, and they, they try other things. Uh, just the, the way the whole sort of student systems work the last uh, maybe 20, 30 years or so, uh, everybody's loaded up with debt. Um, so everybody can get to school, and, but they, they're, they're loaded with debt, and they need to pay that off. And it's just, it's just a little bit mad chaos, especially for uh, a lot of the recent graduates. Uh, here's one student who's suing the school because uh, they, they thought they'd get a job right away, which, you know, a lot, I, don't know, I don't know what to say, but, you know, a lot of people entered the, the job market, especially after the economy collapsed a bit in 2008 until things started picking up a little bit. Um, you know, recently, you know, more people have been getting, more students have been getting hired, uh, but that's mainly because there's fewer students. So the, the, there's been a big decline in terms of uh, the, the law school uh, grads recently. Uh, just as concerning as, uh, you know, sort of recent college grad or recent law school grads is what's happened to sort of the older lawyers who've had to find work. And this has probably been a, a bigger thing I've seen where firms have sort of uh, broken up and lawyers who have been part of larger firms or part of mid-sized firms suddenly are sort of out on their own. They need to figure something out. Uh, normally they have pretty good skills, but they're not quite sure how to do their uh, uh, client development and sort of get clients uh, coming in. So that's been a you know, that's been something I've, I've talked to a, a lot of folks about in terms of what, you know, what can they do to start getting clients. And that's, that's something that I think is relatively important. Although, obviously, what applies to the young folks also applies to the older folks. Um, and just, just a, a few things about, you know, how some of the older lawyers are having a rough time. <clears throat> I don't think there's quite the same uh, age discrimination as there is in the tech industry for older lawyers. But 
uh, older lawyers have a little bit harder time sometimes uh, picking up some of the tech in order to do the, the online client development at least. Of course, you know, people want to leave law because it's hard, hard to work. When there's work and people are working, I think people are relatively happy with law. I think the biggest issues that folks have is they're just getting frustrated. There's been a lot of sort of price pressure and stuff in terms of the, uh, uh, the ability to sort of to make a, a better living. And this is this slide. This actually uh, you know, came from uh, uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, and, and it was in a American Lawyer uh, a publication. Uh, but this is probably the more concerning part for law, that from what I see, is that you know, since 2004, the, the sort of the legal services sector, sort of the the, the revenue that's coming to all the lawyers, has decreased by 20 percent in, in real terms. Uh, and even last year, or 2014, you know, still still decreasing from 2013. Uh, it's you know. It's not good uh, right now. Um, and while they do expect some growth sort of going forward, I mean, obviously things went pretty far down when the economy went to hell and, you know, it's taken a while sort of to build out of it. Uh, there's not that much growth. So, you know, you could say part of that was, you know, maybe that's uh, legal Zoom's fault, right, or uh, Rocket Lawyer or something. Uh, but I don't really think they're cutting that much into the services. I think a large part of this has been large companies uh, forcing law firms sort of to reduce their cost and you have a lot of the larger firms sort of having you know groups of attorneys either overseas or I think there's like a, I read something they had some guys in Morgantown West Virginia because of lower cost of living but they're also paying these lawyers less money and so there's there's different things going on there so they try to reduce their cost uh, in order to uh, please the, the corporate folks who have gotten much more aggressive on controlling uh, both uh, litigation and legal costs in general so it's it's just it's a little bit tougher than it was, um, and certainly there's different sectors of the market or different sort of practice areas, but it's getting a little bit, quite a bit tougher. Um, just a couple quick things here. This is sort of getting a job, you know, that's students trying to get a job, just trying to get hired by another firm. That's one thing I'll discuss. The other one is sort of basic client development, and this is uh, Jim Butler, he has this thing called Meet the Money which is in L.A., does a lot of real estate uh, things, like hotels and things like that. Donald Trump Jr. was there, so that's, that's pretty cool. Well, maybe not. Um, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> uh, but, there, there, but it's two different things, right? I mean, there's a lot of folks that just want to get a job so they can get on with their lives, and they might want to use, you know, online stuff, social media for that. And that's, there's a certain, thing, certain set of things that you need to do there. And others, you know, they've got their job, and they just want to grow their business, and they want to sort of dominate it. And the one thing I would say that, that I've seen is that whether you're with a small firm or a large firm, the only real job security that exists right now is if you're able to bring clients in. So you might be a great lawyer. And that's, that, look, sure, there's a few lawyers that are so great that they're, gonna, they're always going to have uh, work. But those, those lawyers that are actually bringing in clients are the ones that have the, the greatest job security because they are sort of an, an army of one. And, and everybody wants them. Everybody wants to hire them. They want to bring that book of business over. Um, or if they're a you know personal injury firm or criminal uh, folks, criminal law, you know criminal defense, you know if they're pulling in clients and pulling in revenue, they're able to grow their firms and, and sort of hire more people. Uh, so I, I really think that the client development part's much more important. I, and I don't think you really get that in law schools too much. Um, so I'm briefly going to make my rant about law schools, and then I'll continue on to what the talk's about. Uh, so. Uh, I think the, you know, to, to me, the, the big thing with law schools, there's, there's a couple things. One, I think it's, you know, a lot of it is, is disconnected from the practice of law, and I know there's getting people to think critically and stuff like that. Uh, but if, and I, and I, you know, I know you want to get more people in the clinics, and there's different things there. To, to me, the, the biggest problem with law schools, which it doesn't really have anything to do with that, has to do with the fact that you, you, give people classes at least the first year, a little bit the second year, where for a lot of the classes, 100% of your grades on the final exam. And what happens is you end up, you're trying to learn and sort of get a whole law school, but you also watch television, you procrastinate, you go out to the bar. I mean, it worked great for me. I'm, I'm a really good test taker. I mean, I'm, you know, some people don't quite get all the knowledge that they know onto the test. I always get everything I know. I might not know everything. I'm a great test taker. That's my skill set. It was my skill set back when I was in the academic world. But for a lot of people, you, they're just, you know, they're just trying to get ready for the test, and then they forget it. It's, it's not good. Um, and I'll compare that to like engineering school, where we had lots of pro we had ongoing projects. I mean, I was busy. I had something due every week, or I had group projects and different things like that. But you get a little bit later on in law school, maybe if you do some certain electives. But I, but I don't think that that 
you get quite enough project-focused uh, work um, unless you decide to take it. And if you want to be in law school and avoid it, you could, you could take just classes with final exams, do a few writing classes in your set. Uh, it's really, uh, I think it's, it's really sort of a problem. Uh, the other part is that most lawyers, uh, maybe two-thirds of them, uh, are somehow involved with actually running a small business, uh, whether they're solos or part of small firms. And that is, that is business. I mean, I, I can tell you, I've talked to thousands of lawyers uh, from my fine law days and through Justia uh, now. And almost the number one thing I can tell you is whether they're, the attorneys I'm talking to are successful or not, regardless, more important than even their SEO ranking on Google, uh, is whether they're organized. And you can tell when you talk to folks. Do they do things in an organized manner? Are they able to make appointments? Are they thinking systematically? When you have conversations with them, do we have sort of an outline in terms of what they're sort of going for? Uh, you know, the, the organizational skills, again, I think, you know, just having finals, you lose a lot of that organizational skill type of thing. You need to build that up by doing projects. And uh, you, we sort of get people out there and suddenly they're out working and trying to do small business stuff. They got accounting stuff. They got their own collections to do. They got their own bills to pay. They, they need to do some marketing. Um, and it's, the, the skill set's not there. And most of these guys try to learn on the fly, but it, you know, they, they basically, in my, I would say, lose somewhere between three and four years of what they could be doing if the law schools took, I don't know, one year, they'd take one class overall and force everyone to take it on basic law practice, get them actually sort of talking about how to run a, a law firm. And it's not just practicing law. I mean, practicing law is maybe 35 to 40 percent of it. And a lot of the law these days is just filling out the forms. You do a bankruptcy, you go there and you just fill out the forms, get the stuff, and you, you know, you have the, you see Sears still show up, nobody else shows up, and that's it. But so it's, there, there are things like that that people don't quite get because they're thinking about, uh, I don't know, Griswold and whether, you know, Roe v. Wade was properly, that's great, but I'm talking day-to-day -day stuff, which is a lot of the lawyers. Uh, they're actually practicing. I don't think that they're quite getting it, even if they are getting the, the basic sort of uh, analysis of you know, how to think. Um, okay, so that, that's, the, that's the basic stuff I have on, on the law schools and the market. So the market is shit, and people are uh, having a rough time getting jobs, and law schools can do a better job. But I know you guys are always thinking about that as it is. Uh, first, the, let me sort of walk through here on, on the uh, social media stuff. Uh, the big news, of course, is that Google Plus is putting up brand new profiles. So this is the old one. This is new ones. Who here has a Google Plus profile? And who uses Google Plus? Right. There are a few folks, yeah. It's big. Um, so the, the real thing that happened uh, this last week was uh, LinkedIn got, is getting purchased by uh, Microsoft. This actually matters. So the Google Plus is, you know, it's on it. I'm on it, but I think I uh, You can connect. Give me my circle. Uh, uh, so, so Microsoft's buying LinkedIn. And LinkedIn, uh, for all practical purposes, uh, is the, the one place that every lawyer needs to be. Um, you can, for, you know, you know, there's Martindale Hubble, right? There's Lawyers.com. You know, there's Justia has a directory. Fine Law has a directory. Avo, right? Avo has a directory. Everybody's a 10. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> there is no bigger lawyer directory than LinkedIn in terms of lawyers have actually filled out their profiles. There's nothing bigger. And there's nothing more important from a lawyer standpoint in order to get a job than being on LinkedIn. That is, that's the number one thing. It's not even having a good blog on, that's ranked high in Google. The number one thing you need to do to get employment if you're a young lawyer and law student is to be on LinkedIn. And that you need to fill it out and then you need to connect. That, I, I, can't, I, I can't understate that. Um, so I don't know exactly what Microsoft's gonna do with it because you know initially I put my talk together, I didn't see that coming. Uh, but. We'll see what happens. I, I, I have no idea what that means. Um, go. My brother works for LinkedIn. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. So, 
Except they, they, I think they got moved to Windows platform and the Windows Cloud, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we'll, I mean, we'll have to sort of see. But yeah, it does sound like you know, maybe they'll run as an independent entity for at least a while. Um, so th this is, you know, at least, you know, because LinkedIn's down the street from me and they bought the, they closed my gym and they bought the land across the street to put their new headquarters, which um, I'll leave it there. Uh, cause that's, uh, that's why their stock fell in, in half because they bought my gym and closed it, but then it went back up because Microsoft's buying them. So everything's even out for LinkedIn. Uh, but th this, this is really the, the key thing. And I, I would say this is not just true for lawyers. This is true for anybody. Uh, if you're in the tech industry, if you're a law librarian, it doesn't matter. LinkedIn will turn out to be uh, the, the best place for you to find a job. And even if you have a job that you like, you should still be in LinkedIn and, and sort of make your connections because there's nothing like getting new job opportunities coming, you know, looking at you. I mean, I get contacted at least a few times a month. Uh, I get a lot more sort of business opportunities <laughs> a month, but uh, for, for, for real jobs. I mean, C, you know, CEO, CTO type jobs that I might want if uh, I wasn't doing what I was doing. And I get connected about for, for other people in terms of references and stuff all the time, at least a few times a week on that. Um, so LinkedIn's really the sort of the, the main sort of key thing on that. Uh, and that's really the, the big news. And I'm going to go into much more detail about LinkedIn first because I do think they're important. Um, the one other thing I, I would note is that on a personal level, you want to have social media profiles, it, you know, on all the different sites. You don't necessarily have to participate on all of them, but you want to have them. And the reason is, is they tend to rank really well in Google. So like your LinkedIn profile will rank well, your Facebook one will rank well. And so I, I did a search on Tim Stanley, but some uh, right-wing uh, guy from Great Britain has taken over my name who writes, uh, he's very conservative for an academic. Um, but he has lifetime tenure, so I guess he can afford to be. Yeah, uh, it's, yeah, well, yeah, I know it goes for you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's really not that bad, John. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> so uh, you know, here's Stacy, though. I, I pulled Stacy up. I just searched Stacy Stern, and it's her LinkedIn profile. Here's her Twitter account, and here's her Facebook uh, account. And if I kept going, you'd, you'd see a Google Plus on the next page. And, and then I put my own profiles in just because I've, Wanted to put my own profiles here. So here's like my LinkedIn profile. Here's my Facebook profile after the Sharks lost to the Penguins. Uh, here's my uh, Twitter profile. Here's my Google Plus profile. This is the, the current original one, not the new Google Plus, which you just saw. Uh, my Avo profile. I'm a 10 on Avo. Very good attorney. Uh, Martindale profile, which, well, okay, I haven't filled it out, but I'm there. Uh, SSRN. I was uh, the initial programmer for SSRN back in the long day before I quit and started fine law. Um, and now they're part of uh, Reed Elsevier. I'm sure that'll be great. Um, and uh, uh, my Just Here profile, which is like a cleaned up version of LinkedIn, bigger fonts. And, uh, oh, and, and those are just, those are my profiles. So the, the main thing though is you like to control your name or if you're like John or like me, you'd like to control your name with some other sort of something like technologists or something that sort of would be the next thing they search for when they realize they're not going to find you just typing your name uh, on, on Google. Yeah, that, that just protects your reputation. So that, that's really sort of key. And it's really easy to do. Uh, you just sort of set it up and you put these different profiles up and then just go to sleep. I mean, participate in the areas that you want, but you don't have to participate on Twitter to have a Twitter profile. Um, so that, there, there are things like that that you can do that they are pretty good. Very important, though, from a reputation standpoint, because when people are looking to hire you, or uh, looking to, you know, either from a job stamp from a job standpoint, or just, you know, from a, you know, hire you to, to represent them, they're going to look you up on Google. Everybody gets looked up there. It'd be good if you control at least the first couple pages of results and have what you want to have up there, even if it's the exact same thing, you know, ten different times. All right, now I'm going to sort of go into LinkedIn. Uh, so. The first thing, you know, you should sign up. Uh, the, the big thing about LinkedIn, again, is this is the number one place where uh, folks have uh, professional resumes online and where professional connections have been made. And it's, you know, it's a little bit spammed up. Sure, it's a little bit spammed up. But it's still really, really good. Um, you know, they're, they're trying to go a little bit into more professional social media. I think they bought SlideShare and a couple other things like that. So you're starting to get these, like, uh, Facebook-type feeds on, on, the, on the homepage. Uh, but from a, 
a, a pure sort of, uh, you know, finding a job or getting a business client at least, uh, but let's just say finding a job. The, the big thing here is that people will get connected to you or get connected to your connections, and it can really lead to opportunities. And it's something that you can't get if you just do like an internal law, law school network. So I know a lot of the law schools have their own network for alumni. That's great. But you're just as likely to get a job from someone who's not an alumni at your school. What the law school should be doing is getting all their students into LinkedIn and telling them to connect to each other right away in LinkedIn and connect to the professors right away in LinkedIn. Because it's awkward sometimes they have to ask somebody to connect to you. Right? I went to law school with you back, remember, a long time ago? It's you know, 20 years ago, whatever. But if you do it right when they enter and you sit down there and the professors also connect in, and the professors have huge value in terms of connecting these students because the professors are all connected to other, you know, other lawyers that own firms and things like that or you know, for, for different purposes. That would be a, that, that would be a huge value. And, I, and I've, I've talked to different law schools about this, and some, some might do it, some might not do it. But to me, getting the, the current students into LinkedIn is probably the most important thing that a law school can do right now as far as their uh, sort of career development goes. Because you have no idea what the hell is going to happen to these students five, ten years from now. You don't know. They might be part of a firm that went under. They might have tried. Maybe they stopped out of the workplace for a bit and they came back in. But if they're still connected to everyone on LinkedIn, that they've got the ability to post something looking for a job and stuff, and they don't have to sort of start all over trying to find these connections that they had. And again, I, I'm going to say one more time, it's just as important for the professors to connect to all these students as it is for the students to connect to the students. But I'd almost have like a day where I brought in all the students from the 1L students when they start up and say, all you guys are creating a LinkedIn profile today. You're going to spend, you know, take your resume, you're going to put it online, we're going to spend two hours on that, and then you're going to connect with each other. Give me your, you know, give me your URLs and here they are. Go connect with your, with your brethren. And all the professors are going to connect with you because that's part of their job is to help them get jobs. I mean, that, that sort of needs to take place. Or, you know, or the other folks that work at the law school, all the tech folks, everybody. That should, be, that should be something that's relatively important. Uh, I would say the same thing's true with anybody that works anywhere, that you should go into LinkedIn and you should try to get connected up to folks. I do it whenever I go, like I was at Wilson Sonsini uh, helping a guy who's uh, got, got a different uh, company going. I was just meeting with a few other folks there on the knowledge management side. I immediately went back and I immediately sent them uh, LinkedIn requests to connect. And I got two out of three, which is pretty good. I mean, the third one may be later. Uh, they log in. But they, they will get notices about it, and it's, and it's a, a, a core thing to do. Like, everyone can connect to me on LinkedIn. You know, if, if it looks like I am somehow would know you, I, I'd like to connect to you. Uh, that, that's, it's, it's, a big sort of, uh, it's a big sort of win. Um, so, so, you know, here you, you, you basically get a LinkedIn profile. You should fill it out fully. Uh, and that's, that's probably, you know, that's certainly important. You should write a good summary and things like that. And so this is my basic edit screen that I would see. See, I'm an all-star, because I was on LinkedIn early or something. Uh, but I, mean, I was on LinkedIn when it was like under 20,000 people. It was still starting up. Uh, and, and half the people, I think, were bots. <laughs> like, they were real uh, back then. But you know, certainly they have like 300, 400 million people now. And at least half are real people. Uh, here, here's what it would look like. To, here's what my profile looks to someone I'm connected to. Now, look, I'm not really looking for a job. So I don't have a professional photo up. And I have a picture of my dog. But you would put something nicer if you were looking for something, right? You put, wear a suit. I mean, don't look, you know, if you want to get, I mean, you could get hired as a programmer wearing a sweatshirt, but you're not gonna, you can get hired as a lawyer wearing a sweatshirt, but I don't care. But that, that's me though. You know, students should, you know, look sharper than that. Um, and this is what my profile would look like to someone who wasn't connected to me on LinkedIn. So this is, you know, there's different views. And you should look at what the different views are for folks. And ideally what you want to do is you want to open up as much data to everybody who searches you, uh, even open up your profile to Google, to be indexed. You have control over that. Um, the one other thing I would say about LinkedIn is that you should go in your privacy settings. If you don't want people knowing that you're visiting their profiles, set that, all right? I think the default is they'll see who you are. At a minimum, they'll see who you, what your, your, your uh, what, where you work in your, in your profession, so in, in, your, in your job title. So those are things just to note. There's a hundred little things you could do on LinkedIn profiles. There's tons of blog posts. There's tons of articles written about it. I'd go read the articles. You know, don't put website. Put the name of your company in, right? Like I put Justy at Raymond website. The little minor things like that. Uh, but that that's secondary to actually just getting a LinkedIn profile and filling it out. So just that that's important, especially for the students. 
and, and realistically for all the alumni as well. Uh, after your profile is basically filled out, the most important thing is connections. And you should put your address book up. You should try to find and connect with everyone. And whenever you go to meetings, like here, you guys should all connect with each other. You never know. It could lead to future opportunities. The more people you're connected to, the more opportunities that pop you know, in your direction. I even tell this to my own employees, even though I know that I've lost some folks at our company because they got contacted on LinkedIn. Because I, because I know it's in their best interest, and I know that you just have to do it. I mean, you, get, you realize you have to tell people to do it in their best interest, even if they're working for you. Um, it's, it's the, there's, there's no better way to, to get opportunities coming down your door, if you're connected to enough people, right? If you're only connected to five people, yeah, I don't know. But if you're connected, you know, it, it's pretty easy to connect to 500. It'd be faster than, faster than you think. And, uh, and then you just keep connecting to people whenever you go to, to the conferences, you meet people. Just, that should be a constant thing that students should do, uh, anyone that's, you know, interested in getting jobs. And, and just do it, and don't worry about any awkwardness or not. I mean, I don't really know those guys at Wilson Sonsini. I just met them for like five minutes, but yeah, you know, seemed nice. Now I'm connected. I, I, I connect to most folks. I get a, connected by a lot of sort of uh, service providers uh, overseas and things. I don't really, they aren't really connected. I don't know who the hell they are. I don't, I, mean, I got like 400 or 500 invitations sort of sitting there. I don't disconnect, I don't like Mark, I don't want to connect to them. I just sort of look at them, I try to figure out Maybe later I'll connect to them. If they're a lawyer, I'll connect to them always. Um, if there's someone that looks like they're connected to people I know, I'll go read their resume and I'll see if I want to. But if they aren't connected to anyone I'm connected to, and it looks like they just want to sell me uh, SEO services uh, out of India, uh, it's fine. They're probably good. Uh, but I'm not going to necessarily connect to them right away. Uh, so I, I don't know. That's. But certainly the people that you do know in law school folks, like every, you should go into different groups and connect everyone in the group that's a member of your law school and things like that. that, that that's just a no-brainer. And it helps if the law schools tell people this is what we're encouraging people to do in the group. So if they go to the group and they say, hey, we want everyone to connect to each other. So if you start getting invitations from other people at Chicago Kent, why don't you guys connect, right? Things like that. Um, so those, those, <clears throat> those types of things can be very helpful. And then, again, longer term, You've got this network of alumni that even though you don't control it within your own private law school network, you've actually created real value for these folks, and they're starting to bring in outside connections as well. And those might be business relationships, those might be referral relationships for other types of cases, or those might be job relationships. So nobody's really doing this yet on the law school side. I mean, nobody's really sat down and made this uh, a focus of, like, future uh, career development. Um, but if I had to do something, I would do this. This is much more important than building up an internal network where we're going to randomly post the 10 jobs that we get that come in from different law firms on an email list. Not that I discount the value of an email list. They're valuable. But LinkedIn is much more valuable in terms of uh, the, the, the core value. So you want to build up your connections. And uh, that's, that's the core thing from individuals. And that needs to be encouraged by the law schools. Secondly, the law schools have a few pages. They've got basically two pages. They've got one page, which is as an employer. And the only way you can really tell is the word companies up here at the very top. And they get a page that's uh, sort of shown as a law school, as a university, which sort of connects to all the people who say they're a part of the, uh, the university. So it's, I don't know why there's two, uh, but whoever runs the law school should get connected to that. And they, and they should use that law school page to promote out that they want people to connect. So you need to take advantage of your, your law school page, which everyone that went to your law school will go to and say, hey, we want people at Chicago Kent to connect. You know, we want people at Michigan to connect. And it, it's something that, that you sort of have to push along because even though you might be able to get it done quicker for the students currently in class, you know, that, that you control every day because you control their grades and everything, uh, the, uh, you can't necessarily do that for the people that have graduated and you need to somehow bring them back in. The other thing is I would encourage folks that have graduated to go add a LinkedIn profile, make sure they add, you know, tell them they should make sure they put their school in and follow the school pages. So you can, that way you can get announcements to them as well. But whatever you, whatever you end up doing is LinkedIn will end up being a better sort of platform, unless Microsoft, you know, screws it up, which I don't know. Could happen. So that didn't, they don't, I'm, sure they, I'm sure they'd be fine. Uh, but right now, as an independent entity, LinkedIn's a better platform for you than anything that you can develop in-house in terms of getting actual use out of. And it's not even close. 
So you spend all these IT resources, all this stuff, and all these meetings stuff. You know, just tell your students and your alumni to get on LinkedIn and get control of those groups and get control of those pages. And do a good job on those pages, and they'll actually turn out to be a bigger win. So anyways, two pages. The employer page, that's where you might post jobs and different things like that. And then there's the uh, uh, school page. All right, the other thing that you have is you have different groups. Um, now, there's lots of different groups on LinkedIn, and anyone can sort of create a group. And if you go in there, you'll, you know, might discover lots of sort of groups that are around. Uh, this is the Michigan one. Uh, and the, what's interesting about the Michigan one is the Michigan one's actually controlled by the people that work at the school. And groups are, are good. I mean, groups are, are, are quite powerful in because you can push out emails and things like that, and it, does, it gets that interaction that you're not going to get on the pages. You're not going to get that really on the company page. You're not going to get that on the school page, at least in the current uh, versions. And I know LinkedIn's trying to go back and talk to some of the group owners. They've had things have changed quite a bit over time. Uh, but it, to me right now, it's from a, a law school standpoint, it's a separate area where you can actually tie people into conversations as well. So it's more than just a one-way push. But you need to control it. So like here, Michigan has their immense. There's career planning, is the owner. You got communications folks. You got both your uh, career folks and you got your uh, sort of a development office uh, controlling the groups. Um, and, and that part's good. The, the one thing I would say that most people that really go, you know, I mentioned LinkedIn, you get jobs on LinkedIn, but the other reason people go on LinkedIn is to look for jobs. And so I would post periodically jobs into LinkedIn. I post make those messages. And they, they often, in groups will have a separate job section. Uh, those jobs disappear pretty quick. If you want to make sure the job sticks around later, longer, put it into a conversation. Uh, LinkedIn really wants you to pay to really get your jobs featured, so it's a little bit harder just to post them in your group. But you can always start them off as a conversation, and that always sort of leads to things. Uh, so this, you know, Michigan, you know, 4,800 members, it, you know, it should be doing better than that. I mean, it's a lot of, it's a big school. Uh, but it's, it certainly has at least the focus and the attention of, of the administrators in terms of who's running it. I mean, this is like, a, you know, it, it's a good group, and it looks like they have support staff there as well. You need to keep conversations going. You need to do you need to do work, but it's not that much work, and you'll get more value out of it than doing the same conversation on a private network. Um, here's an example. This is I just searched Harvard Law here, uh, and I search in my Zoom. I normal Chicago can search, but they didn't have one. <laughs> so uh, Harvard has a ton. Uh, there's all different types of groups here, and. You know, if I ran the law school, I would try to sort of figure out what the groups are and try to figure out who's running things, just so I had a little bit of idea. You don't have to control them all, uh, but except for the big alumni one. That's the one you want to control. Um, and if someone's already controlling it, you ask them for permission to take over as owner. You, you really need to control that one as, as, a, as a law school. Here's the, the Harvard one. Now, have, the Harvard alumni one was interesting in that the uh, this guy, uh, I don't know if this guy's real or not, if he's just a alias for someone that works at Harvard. Hey, look, I've got a Michigan ad because I visited the Michigan page first. So, uh, But the, the administrator of the Harvard Law Alumni Group is not someone at Harvard. So they don't have control of it. They don't have control over what gets featured, you know, like this featured post here, which is someone, you know, looking for two positions for a bankruptcy associate in, in New York and Los Angeles. That's controlled by him. That's not controlled by Harvard. And Harvard might want to have their own messages on their alumni group rather than what a private individual wants to put in. Um, now that could this guy could be the Harvard's career placement officer, and these happen to be two jobs, and he put him in there, and I, it's just he's pretending he's from South Dakota. Uh, I don't know, but probably, probably not. Uh, so that, that's a, a separate thing, though. But you want you want to control uh, you want to control your group. So the, at least the big alumni group, and then realize other groups will, will pop up, and then keep track of what else is going on. That's that's relatively important to do, and then. Again, the, the big thing on LinkedIn, if you want to keep folks going, is jobs. All right, here are two, here, here are two uh, folks that you know, used to work for me at Fine Law back in the day. Uh, one's Leonard Adler. And he just, and I remember when he started this group, because I was playing around with groups uh, when they first came out. I never really did anything with it, because just, yeah, we were just pretty you know, free law. We weren't getting enough uh, things going. Uh, but he started one for green jobs, which are any environmental jobs. And he's got over 100,000 people in that group. He, all he has to do is, you know, the more people join, the more people that join. But what drives his sort of uh, ownership of members is the fact he posts jobs. He names it, you know, granted it's called Green Jobs, but it's the jobs that people come back to. 
It's like the legal newspapers, right? What do you read in the legal newspapers? You read the gossip about the judge and the attorneys. You read a few sort of short case summaries, and then you look through the job section at the back to see what are jobs that you don't really want a job, but you always look through it, like the you know, daily journal and things like that. Jobs are a big part of any sort of thing that involve sort of constant current awareness, even if people are employed. So if you can somehow work jobs into your group, you now have a reason that people will keep coming back. They'll come, even if they don't want the job, they're going to come back and they'll just check their group, say, well, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'll leave Kirkland Ellis, it's not that great, you know, something like that, and just see what's there. So uh, those types of things uh, drive traffic, drive membership. So Green Jobs, again, this is just a single guy, right? You know, just, just one guy just started this thing, it's 100,000 folks. Uh, it'd be easy, you know, even if you want to limit it to your own alumni, you'd easily sort of get ownership of it. Or if you're a law school and you want to really own a section of LinkedIn, you could do a law jobs place as well. You could do all law jobs, and you could sort of be the law school that runs it. Um, nobody's done a great job on that. And this is David Rodinsky, another uh, uh, ex-fine law guy who has a cost per click company that just got bought for a lot uh, recently. Um, but he had a job board just for people in the Silicon Valley, just for his buddies. And he had, you know, 40, 90 folks in there. And this is, these are people that know him and that are, you know, involved, you know, Mountain View, you know, Peninsula area, just posting different things. And he actually ended up making a spreadsheet that he put together, which uh, he can now sort of feed it in from a Google, Google spreadsheet, which is pretty good. Jobs, though, drive renewal, you know, jobs keep people coming back to read stuff. You know, writing about a new uh, seminar series, that's something you want to fit in there, but it's the jobs or the repeat news, or the repeat stuff that people want to see, even if they're employed. Companies can also have pages, so that's pretty, you know, easy to do. This is our page. Uh, this is the edit mode of our page. Uh, you know, are you going to get a lot of traffic off it? Not a huge amount, but, but law firms should certainly have it, so you should encourage law firms that... Uh, that you guys know, uh, that, that, you know, connected to your university, run by alumni, they should have their own page. All they need is their own domain name, you can, uh, uh, an email address at their own domain, and uh, you can get a page on LinkedIn. Pretty easy to do. Uh, and then LinkedIn is, is moving into the direct services market. This is stuff that they've done relatively recently, where they're sort of doing lead gen. And they're doing lead gen across a number of markets, but law is one of their big markets. And so right now there's connections, they have different lawyers that are being featured, and it's sort of they're testing their toes right now into it. But it's, you know, pretty good. And what's nice about it is we'll try to get you connected up with lawyers that you're connected to. So it gives you a, uh, there's a preference sort of built in to a certain extent for lawyers that are somehow connected to you, although lawyers do need to sign up for the service. From LinkedIn's standpoint, it's really sort of tying into sort of what Avo or what Internet Brands has done in terms of really trying to connect consumers directly with the, uh, or canoes consumers, non-lawyers with lawyers. And it, it's a pretty good system, and there's a higher trust factor with LinkedIn, although there's a disclaimer that says they're not responsible for anything. Uh, but, you know, it's something to note. And you do get, you know, it's good data on the, on the attorneys. So you come in here, you, you fill stuff out, and the number one legal service might be notary, which not really law, but, you know, it's something people need sometimes. They sort of classify it there. Everything else is a law practice. And I would say right here, this is how they... Uh, make revenue, which is why they start off with personal injury, then DUI, then criminal. I mean, this is a, you want to know how to make money off of consumer lawyers. This is your list in order, pretty much, at least from my experience with uh, fine law and just you. Um, so IP lawyers don't, never want to advertise. <laughs> but personal injury guys, DUI, no, it's yes. Uh, and then you, you fill it out. I put, fill out business, and then it sort of walks you through different steps. No, no big deal. But this sort of tells you what LinkedIn's going into, and lawyers should sign up for the service uh, if, if they want to get some more business directly from LinkedIn, or just to try it out. It's never, it's never a better deal than when it first comes out because they'll cut deals with you. Later on, once they have, you know, everything sort of rolling, then it'll be harder to deal. So something else for lawyers to do. All right, so I want to quickly sort of summarize LinkedIn, which is sort of my, my main thing. I'm doing, time -wise here. I'm doing fine. i got 20 more minutes. All right, LinkedIn's like the one I really cared about here. Finding a job is the best platform out there. Uh, there's plenty of jobs posted there. People will connect you to jobs. You'll get contacted. If you build up your network and get connected to other lawyers and other people, you know, that are in the, the legal profession. Um, for just finding work, for getting, like, referral work, it, it tends to work okay for, like, business, IP, better than a lot of different things where people are looking for personal referrals. Um, not as good for, like, personal injury or criminal. I mean, a lot of people don't want to talk to their buddies saying, hey, I got a DUI. Can you re refer me to someone on LinkedIn? That doesn't, you know. 
or bankruptcy. Uh, but you know, business type stuff, it's really good. And it's a great place for lawyers and non-lawyers to connect up uh, business-wise. So all the, all the local businesses, it's a separate thing. If you're a law firm, you want to connect up with local businesses, you'll end up getting referrals. Because people are always looking for, people don't ever want to talk to lawyers until they need a lawyer and somebody asks a lawyer and you need to find a referral. And then you have to sort of go through it and you end up doing the same thing everybody does, Google searches, if you don't know somewhere right off the hand. But LinkedIn's a great way for that. So it does lead to, to, to certain business that way. Um, the best platform right now for law school alumni uh, connections, sort of controlling the alumni. There's nothing better. Nobody really objects to going to LinkedIn. There's a lot of people that object to going on Facebook. And Google Plus, uh, yeah, and so this is best. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I spent so much time on Google Plus. I guess. Anyways, that's a longer term. Uh, alumni groups, this is also a great place to control your alumni groups, but you need to work and you need to get jobs in there. If you just put alumni groups up with seminars and stuff or different announcements about the, the law school, that's fine, but people start ignoring it. If you mix in jobs just once in a while, you'll get people reading the other stuff that you also want them to read. All right, but it's the best. This guy here, Georgetown Law Grant, Green Jobs guy. He, you ever have questions, you can ask Leonard. Okay. Leonard Adler, he knows everything about LinkedIn. He knows more than I do. So I asked about it. It's, it, it has to happen. So if, if you want the, it, it's, it's really, I'm sorry to step back, it's really not just for immediate jobs. Immediate jobs are going to interview on campus is for the later future stuff when they suddenly lose their job or need a job, or they're, they're two years out. It's, it's just, it's a, it's a relatively big deal, but they need to connect with everybody, you know, that they know as well. All right, Facebook. All right. All right, that's fine. This is my Facebook profile. It's the Sharks lost to the Penguins. I lost a bet. Uh, we got, you know, we, we have a lot of pages on Facebook. So there's a lot of stuff that we do here. We got uh, the Justy page, we got uh, Justy Mexico page, we have Justy Latin America page. Those pages combined have over 500,000 folks. Uh, we have a page for every court, which is basically a one-way push of blog feeds. Um, you know, this is 1,600, it depends. Some have a lot more, some have less. We also do it by category. Um, that's fine, Facebook's good, you know, okay, we get, more people sort of will sign up for stuff, but then Facebook doesn't really push out the information to people. It's hard to get people, even if you post something, unless you sponsor it now, Facebook wants your money, they don't really show it all the time. Uh, there are some exceptions, but for law stuff, you just don't get the distribution that you think. Um, here's a Michigan uh, Facebook page. Uh, and again, they don't post that often on it. I, I think it's, you know, I think it's pretty good for alumni uh, on this. Uh, but the value of Facebook is really on the event side. What you want to do is you want to get people into your alumni page on Facebook and then do events, because events get picked up by folks in ways that other notices and posts don't. And it's the one, it's the one sort of higher value that I think Facebook has over, uh, over LinkedIn. The other thing is, is that uh, for a lot of events, you can start having, inviting other people to events. So I might you know, being, going to an event, I might invite five other people. There's different ways if the event's open that you can sort of do this. And th there's a lot of value there. So the pages have events, but you know, like Michigan, they're, you know, their they're events not even seen here. It's buried under the more tab. Uh, and that's fine. That's one item. Uh, law firms have pages. You know, Fenwick and West has a pretty good page. Uh, you know, Ken Shigley, he was the former uh, president of the State Bar of Georgia. He's a few miles from here, uh, has a page. Um, I will see some of these guys doing sponsored posts, uh, mainly Fenwick and West, but they're, they're doing things whenever their uh, folks do something good, they'll do a sponsored post so people see it. It's the same thing with law schools. It's relatively inexpensive to do, but you might want to take the people that are a member of your group and when something great happens at your law school, sponsor that post so it shows up. It costs you 50 bucks, but people will see it. If you just post it, let's say you have 10,000 people in your uh, alumni group, 
or alumni page, and you just post it, it'll be seen by 60 people, and you'll get a few likes. I mean, we got 150,000. We don't, I mean, unless I sponsor it, nothing, not really. I mean, we got, and we have a lot of political fighting going on on our pages too. Uh, but we don't, you don't get quite the, the same stuff without sponsoring it. And that's just Facebook's algorithm for pages. There's no way around it right now. Um, It makes sure it shows up in people's streams. So right now, you know, most people don't get, unless they're only subscribed, unless they're only connected to a few people or a few pages, they don't get things. But people just start liking all these pages, and then it's very hard to unlike stuff because you have to go find the link at the bottom of the page. Uh, and it's, you, your stream doesn't include everything. They, they select what they want to show you. Um, and so they normally will take business pages out uh, or you know pages out of your stream and keep it focused on people and family and stuff like that, uh, and then spot and then you get sponsored posts. If it's tied in with current news awareness, they'll get more. Uh, Facebook will, if you use certain keywords like congratulations or happy birthday, there's certain words that'll get pushed out more because they think people want to see those words. So there's a, you go to different sites, you can find a list of keywords that you could use to get your posts showing up more. Uh, photos do better than text posts. Uploading a video. I mean, if you want to see the difference between how Facebook treats content on their site and links, upload a video, see what your traffic is, and then link to a YouTube video. You know, on, on Google service, and they won't even show it. I mean, get nothing. So uh, they're really pushing video right now. So if you really want to have someone see your uh, a page without sponsoring it, or a post without sponsoring it, put up a video and then write stuff around it. it doesn't really matter what the video is. They're going to push the video, right? It could just be a cat running around in a circle or something and say, "Look, everybody's working together," or something, and then, then talk about what you want to talk. About. Uh, so it's. They're, they're, I mean, all this stuff, there's, there's, there's a million other things on LinkedIn, there's a million other things on Facebook, but at its core, you know, you set up a page, if you want things to show up, you're going to need to sponsor it. That's at its core. You can, you know, you might get lucky, right? You know, LII has a lot of stuff on the current awareness type things. We get lucky every once in a while. Um, and here's, here's something that always works. This is a hug pug. Now, they got 2.7 million now. I think the last time I brought this up at a Cali conference, they were at like 1.2. So it, yeah, you put, you put pugs up. Yeah, and you, you present that to Kelly. Doubles the traffic, right? That's number 1.5 million. Uh, and we're not the number one pug. It's uh, Roy or some other pug. It's celebrity pug, but you know, that's got movie stars attached to it. Uh, but you know, this is pretty good. Pe pets and things like that. You have a law dog, you have a dog in the office, post your dog on the office. That works, right? Uh, anything involving animals works out pretty good. Uh, so the hug pugs do great. Uh, but we also share a lot of people's stuff, so we don't, you know, we share photos and we mention we're sharing. We don't just post our own dogs. But that, that's what Facebook's made for. That's great. We get 10,000 likes and things like that. Um, this is just groups. So that was, those were pages. Let me go on to groups. So groups, kind of like LinkedIn groups. I just did a search on University of Michigan Law School, and there's all these groups. Now, a lot of these groups are for the uh, different classes. Now, luckily, they uh, label them all, so you can never tell which group's which, because it's University of Michigan Class O, University of Class O, here's a class of, what did they take out of that school class? Well, they must be misspelled a word or something, got rid of a space. Um, but you, anyway, if you get the basic gist, you get, there's, there's all these groups that are occurring with your law school, and you have no idea what's going on here. But you should, at least from a law school standpoint, try to get a sense of it. Um, here's, uh, this is the class of 2000. 13. I can tell because it's up here in the top header thing because I certainly can't see it here on the graphic. On the graphic, it cuts off. It's University of Michigan Law School dot, and the school spelled without an L, dot, dot, dot. You can look at the very top. You can see it. Um, but this is one of the class ones here. Uh, that's fine. I didn't really uh, find any University of Michigan Law School alumni group. And so every law school should have one alumni group. Uh, that they put together. The thing about groups are a couple things. You have them closed or open, that's sort of up to you. Probably keep them closed with invites from other members. Um, people can invite and add people to the group without their permission. So once you get a group, like I'm in my high school group, right, and someone just added me to it, and all of a sudden I was there. Uh, so 
You could have someone do the same thing. You can just start adding all the people you know on Facebook to that group, right? Or have the school set it up and have someone else who's not connected to the school so they don't blame the school for spamming them. But, you know, find the, you know, someone else working and they could add 20 and then someone else could add 50. But you just want to start adding it up and then it grows that way. So it grows quite a bit faster than LinkedIn once you get going on it. But you have to use, it has to be these invite uh, things for people, uh, invite other people or just, you know, add other people and then they can, it's sort of, they add them and then they can, they can opt out. Um, the other thing, uh, and I get it, I'm in like 100 pug groups. I'm always getting added to those. Uh, the other thing to note is that events on groups work out really, really well. So that's, again, just similar to like pages, doing events is a strong, is a strong play with uh, Facebook. And it's even stronger on groups than on pages. Um, so groups are good. I mean, it's more interaction than pages have in certain ways. Normally pages you set so only your posts show up. And there's like a little small subsection where other people discuss stuff because otherwise it you know, gets spammed up with stuff and you don't really control the messaging. Groups is much more back and forth with people. And you can kick people out, you can add people, you can do it, it's like uh, whatever you want. Right? It's like a Survivor. You can add people to the island, kick people off the island, do whatever. You, do whatever. Um, but these groups can go quite fast and you should have at least one alumni group uh, on Facebook. Is it important as LinkedIn? No, not as important as LinkedIn. But you should control it because it might be. You know, who knows what's going to happen. They, Facebook might say, you know, yeah, we have a business thing. Well, we're in business. And we're going after LinkedIn because we don't like Microsoft or something. I don't know. I mean, that happens. And then we have some, like, private groups. Here's our Justia Mexico site. Here's our Justia USA one. There's a lost cat. Uh, I don't know if they found the cat. Um, and those are just private ones that sometimes people have. So you can have private groups as well. And we use it internally, uh, which gives people an excuse to spend all day on Facebook, <laughs> which is great. Um, here's my profile again. Uh, let me sort of go through the, the basics here, and I'm going to try to go pretty quick here as we wrap up here. Uh, find a job. You might find a job on Facebook. Now, it's nearly as likely as LinkedIn. You know, maybe 5% is likely. Lose a job? You can lose a job on Facebook. Yeah, I mean, people do that all the time. And anyone I hire, I go check out everything they've done. And a lot of times, even if it's not public to them, I can somehow find it, and they're tagged in someone else's thing who's made it public, and you don't know what you're going to see. And that includes lawyers. I've seen some stuff of our own clients that are disturbing. Uh, which I then informed them about. Uh, I've seen stuff that are not our clients' lawyers, and I didn't say a word, and those guys, are, you know, we'll see what happens. Uh, but if I can find it, you know, and the search is getting better on Facebook, so just think about that. You know, it was really crappy a long time. It's slowly getting better, and it'll get better and better. Uh, it's, it's okay for finding work in the consumer areas in terms of getting referrals, but it's not great for business on the business side. It doesn't mean that, you know, Fenwick and West is doing sponsored stuff to show how great they are. I've never seen any great outcome for it. I think that there's nice targeting on both LinkedIn and Facebook for ads. I don't know. I don't think running the ads is not the way to go is what I think right now. But that's fine. If you do run ads, run ads to get people to like your page. Don't take people off the, the, the Facebook site. If they like your page, then you own them. At least you believe you own them, except your post won't show up in their stream unless you pay again. But it's something to note. Anyways, I, I can talk more about that later. Uh, alumni connections, it can be good. Uh, so or okay, so it, you can get connected up there, but you have to start. Nobody's really doing it right now. It's really good for events, alumni groups. You know, it's all right. So, all right, I'm gonna quickly go through the last couple ones. Twitter. So my Twitter page. Here's our company page. Uh, this is the Harvard Law one. They have lots of different accounts. Most law schools have a bunch of accounts, right? They have the one for the law school. They have their. Uh, there might be something from the. Uh, Career Center, there might be, you know, this program, that program. Everybody has a Twitter account. People love to use Twitter. Um, that's great. So here's the main Harvard one. A lot of people are on Twitter uh, that use it. It's, you know, there's Rick Clow. He's a, he's a lawyer. He's now at uh, Google Ventures. Um, you know, he uses Twitter a lot. There's some people that just love Twitter. Uh, Tim Wu, we all know him. He uses Twitter and gets it crossed over to, to Facebook sometimes. Uh, so there are a lot of people that use Twitter a lot to communicate. There's this like group of Twitter folks. Um, to me, the best to me, Twitter going on Twitter. You know, I, I used to do it. You got to keep doing it. You got to stay in discussions. It's you know, if you drop out, you drop out. The good news though is you can just jump in anytime you want, right? So you can sort of jump in. The best thing though for Twitter for me is to reach out to the news media. The people that I guarantee you that are on uh, Twitter are news media folks. They're always on. And I'm not, I'm not saying they're just on, they're on, they're participating, they're checking stuff. And all you have to do is tweet something at their name, at their username, and they will read that. Because there's two, the other thing about news media, not just say on Twitter, 
not necessarily posting all the time, but reading it all the time. They will also track anything that mentions their name. And so if you want their name, you want the attention of, a, of, of someone in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, it doesn't matter who, they will read what you do if you tweet at them. So it's the easiest way to get a hold of media folks. There's no easier way than Twitter. So if you use it that way, and every once, you know, you might go back and forth, they'll look who you are, and they might not pay attention to you, but a few times they might start paying attention. So rather than doing a press release, you might announce it to the people in Chicago or the people in New York who are on Twitter, because then they see it on Twitter. They also know that when you tweet at them, there are other people that are following them, and they will also see, hey, did you respond back to those guys at Columbia, right? Because they, they tweeted at you, you know, you, you have a duty now. It was a public tweet. You have to somehow acknowledge. Um, and as law schools, you have higher capital on Twitter than other folks do, right? There's higher capital. As individuals, you've got to make a decision if you want to build out your own personal brand on Twitter or not. You can do it, it'd be great, not great. I did a little bit, I, I like Facebook, because it's, you know, fun, it's got pictures. The Twitter sort of comes and goes, so I'm not on Twitter as much. Um, here's a, here, here are my conservative ones, Bill Crystal and Jay uh, Nordlinger. Jay Nordlinger went to high school with me. Uh, I gave a book report. He interrupted my book report. I had to stop until he stopped talking. There we go. That's my conservatives that I have presented now, so I was even-handed, okay? Uh, but you can reach these guys, too, on Twitter. The other thing you can do with Twitter is you can reach CEOs of big companies. And you cannot do that on anything else. Now, not necessarily everybody, but a lot of folks. And th this is, is CEO.com. They have a list of Fortune. This is a little bit dated sheet. Their, their thing's a little bit outdated. But they will list the, the, the CEOs there in the Fortune 500. They're on Twitter. And then you'll look for the ones that are somewhat active. And you can tweet at them. This is the one place where you can reach CEOs where they will actually read if you tweet at their name because it has their name attached to it. It's not the marketing department, right? So it's, it's something they will look at. And they might not respond because they're busy or whatever, but they will look at it, and you can get their attention. I know lawyers who have gotten work at large, from large companies by tweeting at the CEOs and basically bypassing the general counsel because the CEO was now interested in this person who blogged a blog, uh, blog post that they had written, and all of a sudden uh, it sort of went that way. So it, it, it works on that. You know, some people have a lot of followers. Eric Schmidt has 1.2 million, right? Tony Shee, 2.86 million. Hard to get their attention sometimes. But this guy, you know, guy runs Intel, and he has 10,000 followers. He has, yeah, has General Motors, 20,000 followers. You could get a hold of the head of General Motors by tweeting at her. She will read what you write. Try getting that attention, you know. You know remember Roger and me? You know, that guy couldn't get the attention of Roger, right? So, I mean... You could, you could be the new Michael Moore of Twitter, all right? Just troll them, they'll ignore you. But beyond that, you will get attention. Summary of Twitter, find a job? No, you're not going to find a job on Twitter. Lose a job? There's no better way to lose a job than Twitter. You can, it happens all the time. And that stuff never goes away, and everyone searches it who hires people. Not good for finding work, but you might reach some people that you can't reach any other way. Not great for law school communi you know, alumni communications, but you can do one-way push-outs and stuff. Just one more way to do it. It's easy to do. The best way to reach the press. All right. That's it. Legal social media. That's us in Avo. There's a bunch of other ones. Hey, Case Texas here. That's fine. You're not going to find a job there. You can get some work uh, on the consumer side, at least. Blogging is really good. Uh, if I'm a lawyer, I would do a blog. You can really own stuff. If your blog's good, you will get clients. And you'll get asked to speak at conferences and you'll get more clients that way. Blogging works. You know, a lot of our keynotes here, I believe, were bloggers, and that's how they get introduced to folks and things like that as well. So this, this, this stuff works for practice groups, works for individuals. If I was a lawyer, I'd have my own individual blog, even better than a practice group one. It's, it can be free, bloggers free, WordPress is cheap, and you can put on blog search, we have a good directory of stuff. Lexblog, this Kevin O'Keefe has good stuff. News and ABA Journal has a good blog directory. You might get a job. You will find work if your blog's good. Websites in Google, yeah, here, have your website rank high like these guys do, and you'll get work. Because Google's still, from a website standpoint, 75% of your consumer based contacts, but it's not as much reputation as much as Google rankings. You rank better if your content's better, though, but that's a side issue. Blogging, for this part, you know, blogging is the, the thing I sort of push on people outside of basic social media. This, this does work for people, and they do get high reputations. So LinkedIn, most important. Blogging would be second, but it's a lot more work than Facebook. And Twitter, yeah. use Twitter to reach people, but be careful. 
Don't do stupid stuff. It never goes away. All right. That's all I got. I think I made it a minute over. But all right. Thank you. Be on LinkedIn? LinkedIn. Well, if they really don't want anything up, they don't have to. But aren't they in the bar directories in Martindale Hubble already? I mean, you really you can put the basic information. Then it's just one more directory, and that stuff's already there. Uh, it depends. If you don't want work and you don't want to be seeing people see you, don't go on LinkedIn. You know, a lot of people aren't on LinkedIn. Uh, if your issue is that you just don't like social networks, that's not a good reason not to be on LinkedIn. That might be a reason not to be on Facebook or Twitter. Where once you log in, like Facebook, you log in and then you go visit websites and they're tracking what websites you visited. That's a separate world, right? LinkedIn's not, not that way, so at least yet. <laughs> uh, so I, I think from that standpoint, it, it's pretty good and clean. It's professional, right? It's not a bunch of jokers. Uh, you know, some people put pictures of their dogs up, but most people don't. Most people suit and tie. But for me, law schools, that would be the number one thing for law schools to do. I think if you got that and you really got all your alumni and all your current students in there, you would have a network of job opportunities that would really you know, lift the law school's reputation, help everybody out. But it, you have to get people signed up and then separately get control of the groups. But of all those different things, getting your alumni to get into LinkedIn and connect to each other is the highest thing. Secondary from that is having a group and a page and things like that. But that doesn't compare to actually getting people and getting them connected. The law schools can push that, though, by saying, hey, we want you all to connect to each other. Here's a list of people to connect to. And so it's being pushed by the law school so you remove that awkwardness that people haven't talked to each other in 10 years. And that's where, that's where law schools can also come in and help out. All right. Th thank you.